What's up you guys, Dr. Gunnan back with another sports science video. So tomorrow I have a professional rugby team coming in for a full performance testing battery. And that means most of today is spent really just getting ready for that team to come in to make sure that the athletes have an enjoyable experience and to make sure that the data that I collect is valid and reliable and will be useful to their performance team. So I thought I'd take you guys behind the scenes for a look at what I do before every single performance testing data collection session that I run. The first step, no matter whether you are employed with a sporting organization directly or if you're at a university or you're a student and you get to work with the team, the first step is to meet with the members of the high performance team. That would be the strength and conditioning coach, the assistant coach, the head sport coach, possibly other administrative figures like the athletic director if you're in a university setting, um, uh, the PT, the AT right? I forget all the T's sometimes. And to make sure that everybody on that team is all on the same page. Ideally, this should occur one to two or even more weeks before the data collection actually occurs. And the things that you should go over would include things like the time and date and length of the testing session, the number and order of the athletes testing, the number and order of tests being administered, the number of attempts for each test, the standardized warm-up procedure, the standardized methods for each test, the amount of rest between each attempt, a list of who will be responsible for running each test, and a workflow of how the data will be captured and stored so that nothing is lost on the day of testing. I guarantee you that there's nothing worse as a sports scientist than trying to dig into the data the next day and realizing, oh shoot, where did that piece of data go? Where did that handwritten data collection sheet Go. So make sure that you have um, a system in place for organizing and capturing that data and then delivering it. Make sure that there are people responsible for every step of that process during that high performance meeting. In the days leading up to the testing session, make sure that you review all the protocols for every single test that you are going to do on that day. Whether it's using a complicated piece of equipment like a force frame or whether you're doing a Nordboard testing or you're using force plates or if you're keeping it simple and using a Vertec or maybe doing a drop jump for height. Whatever you're doing, make sure that those protocols are reviewed by you as the person in charge of testing and by each of the technicians who will be responsible for that, whether they're interns or assistant coaches or whomever. Now, these can be in-house protocols, so protocols that you use for your data that will affect your athletes and their training decisions, or they could be standardized in the literature. So if you're a sports scientist who hopes to use the de-identified data to continue driving the scientific process forward, then it should be standardized most likely according to what is found in the literature or at least modified based on a standardization practice that has been validated in previous research. Now, as a sports scientist especially, but maybe even as a strength coach, you'll want to determine whether the data will be used for anything other than making uh, training decisions or game day decisions, right? Usually, performance testing data goes to the coaches, and then the coaches can use it to make the best training decisions. But as researchers and sports scientists, we also know that this data is valuable in driving the scientific process forward in our field. And so you'll want to determine Am I going to put this into an athlete monitoring repository um, that my, say my students can look back on and use for their projects? Or are we just going to keep this all in house? Or is there a particular study that you are part of or interested in conducting that this data will be directly used for? Now, each of those three situations has a different IRB setup or institutional review board setup that you'll probably need to follow. And depending on your particular context, you'll most likely need to write up a proposal for that research and have uh, informed consent documents ready for the athletes when they get there. You'll also have to have some sort of a neutral third party member who explains the protocols to the athletes and lets them know that it is completely optional to opt into the collection process. Now at this point in the video, if you are receiving any value at all, please go ahead and hit the like button for me. And just as a special way of saying thank you, here is an air high five. Now, within the context of high performance testing, of course, all the athletes will undergo the testing procedure if it's something that their coaching staff is mandating. But what they're opting into is allowing you to use their data for research. And so most of the times, if you have an agreement already with the organization, um, the athletes are cool with it, but if they're not, that's okay. They can just opt out. And then you as a researcher just need to make sure that you're only using one, the de-identified data, and two, the data from athletes who opted into your research study. The last thing that you want to happen in any data collection session is for your equipment to power off on you right in the middle of a test. So before the data collection, the day before, 
plug in all of the instrumentation, the force platforms, the Nord board, the timing gates, everything, and make sure that it's at peak charge. Get all of your tablets as well, plug those in, make sure that they're good to go and with a full battery. There's no telling how long the data collection session will take. Oftentimes there are other factors that slow it down as well. Athletes are late, and so you want a fresh and full battery. Also, be sure to bring the chargers with you to the location if it's off-site, just in case you need to charge up uh, in, the, in between tests. Now, not only should you charge the equipment, but you should make sure that you understand it as well. For instance, right now I'm going over the manual for the Fusion Sport timing system because I've only ever used it in teaching demonstrations. I'm not actually super familiar with it. So I'm going to go through some run-throughs, read through how to do a hard reset in case there are any malfunctions, make sure I know how to adjust each of the individual components so that when it comes to testing day, because I'm overseeing the test, I don't want to be responsible for any glitches that uh, cause any time delays. So if you're in charge of the testing session especially, or if you are the technician in charge of any individual component, make sure that you know how every single piece of that instrumentation works. So charge your stuff ahead of time, make sure you know how it works, and then when there are problems, because there inevitably are, you'll know how to fix it. Now it's best practice to give your athletes sufficient familiarization with each of the testing protocols that they'll encounter. And we do this not only so that they meet the technical demands of the actual test, but in order to negate the uh, learning effect that happens when an athlete is new to a test and then they perform it, they give 100% effort, but they can't fully express their fitness because they may not be as skilled at that test as they would be on the third or fourth or fifth uh, attempt. So if you can, in the weeks and maybe even months leading up to the test, introduce these tests, these uh, uh, testing batteries, whether they're jumps or broad jumps or isopoles, at some point in training, some sort of low stakes uh, mock testing, so that the athletes, when they get to testing day, they can truly express their fitness with a 100% effort trial. Now, this is not always possible in the context of high performance, and we also have to think about fatigue and time and scheduling for these athletes. So at the very, very least, we want to make sure that all of the technical demands of the actual test are not only expressed to the athletes and communicated clearly, but also demonstrated correctly. And then during the warm-up on testing day, make sure that they get some sub-max attempt trials at each of the tests. So if it's an isometric mid-thigh pole, make sure that in part of the warm-up, part of your standardized warm-up, and it's in the literature as well, uh, you have 50% and 75% efforts. And just know that that first one or maybe even two 100% efforts, the athlete will still be getting situated and trying to figure out how this feels and how they can best express their strength ability. Now know that if if you go that route and you can't get them a familiarization session separate from the testing session, know that that first session might have the learning effect present. And when you go back and review that data, you might see some rapid improvements in various testing metrics. And those most likely are due, in some part at least, to the learning effect and not actual physiological adaptations or metabolic adaptations to performance. Now, if any of the tests are new to you, it's especially important that you not only familiarize yourself with the protocol, but also run through it yourself so you know how it feels like. Make sure your interns do the same thing um, and the rest of the performance staff, well not everyone, but the key people who are running the test, they should run through the test beforehand. We want everyone to have a lot of at-bats before they do the real thing. The last thing that you want is an athlete giving their 100% effort when you're out there you know, cheering them on or motivating them to do their best and then the test is run the wrong way or the wrong button is pressed and then their effort is not recorded and therefore you know, doesn't count. Uh, that's the last thing that we want as coaches and as sports scientists. Now, even though these days a lot of our performance testing syncs automatically to the cloud, if you're using like a force platform that connects with a tablet or say Vald's ecosystem of performance testing devices like the Force Dex or the Nord board or the Force Frame, or if you're using things from Fusion Sport like Timing Gates or the Freelap Timing System, all of these systems automatically sync to a smartphone via Bluetooth and then to a cloud-based service so you can export that data at a later date when it's convenient for you. However, it's very important that ahead of time, you also have some pre-printed data collection sheets with the athlete testing order, all of their names, perhaps some of their descriptive characteristics like 
height and weight if that's already previously recorded or that you record those on the day of collection. And that's especially important for research purposes um, and for things like relative 1RM or relative peak force to record their weight. And you record that all on a handwritten data sheet as well as one to three key variables from each uh, test that you're running. For instance, in the isometric mid thigh pull next to the athlete's name, you probably also want to record the knee angle so that you can standardize that knee angle over multiple uh, data collection sessions because the actual force plates don't have any way to measure knee angle, nor is there usually any way to indicate that in the device when you're entering information. And then you can also record, uh, say, the peak force on every single attempt. Let's say that you have your intern running the force platforms during counter movement jumps. And let's say that athlete A has six jumps, whereas athlete B has zero jumps. And you go back and you're looking at the data, you're like, where's athlete B's jumps? Well, you, if you look a little bit deeper, you realize that athlete B came right after athlete A. And if you look at the system weight, which is a measurement of the athlete's weight on the force plates before they jump, you notice that it changed after the third jump for athlete A. Furthermore, you realize, wait, we we're only doing three jumps per athlete, not six jumps. And so most likely what happened was that the intern just forgot to switch from athlete A to athlete B when the actual athletes switched. And the last three jumps for athlete A actually belong to athlete B, and you can go in and fix the situation. If that didn't make sense, just go ahead and re rewind the video and listen to that back again, because this trail of breadcrumbs through handwritten data has saved my life so many times when I thought, oh shoot, where is this athlete's data? And in reality, we do have it. It's just that we forgot to switch the athlete's name. So many problems are solved by keeping a trail of breadcrumbs through handwritten data, and I highly, highly recommend it. I guarantee you that if you follow this checklist before every data collection or testing session, that testing day will go much, much smoother. Take my word for it. That said, everything that can go wrong eventually will go wrong if you stick with this business for long enough. Now, collecting the actual data is really just the first part in the process of monitoring, evaluating, and operationalizing your data. So check out my other sports science playlists and videos on the channel if you want more in-depth uh, videos about the concepts and methods behind athlete monitoring and sport performance. Check those out and I'll see you guys on the next video. Alright, one of these videos that's appearing on the screen most likely has some relevant value for you. Yes, you the person watching behind the camera. So go ahead and click over here or over here or subscribe to my channel.